these bases can be used for representation of states or maybe it is used for representation of states so when we apply an eigen uh, when we apply a basis vector to a particular operator we will get an observable value of that particular observable which we call eigen value what happen when we apply a general state which is a linear combination of these bases um okay so wait let me understand your question you're saying that uh, we have an observable a right yes. and you have associated with it some eigen values and eigen vectors right 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 now you're saying that if a acts on ei you hmm. get lambda i ei so you want to know what happens when a acts on a general side state side right, right. yeah of course so we said that as far as hermitian operators are concerned hmm. then these ei are they form an orthonormal basis right hmm. what that means is that every state psi can be expanded in terms of this hmm. like this hmm. right hmm. so yes all you need to do is just just apply this here right hmm. Hmm. so then you will get yeah just work it out with me so you have uh a acting on sum over i ci ei right right, right. then you have a acting on ei so this goes into the sum right it's all linear so then Sorry. you end up with sum over i ci lambda i ei which is not the same as psi right right nor is it you know the same as uh, some uh, scalar times psi or something right, right. so right. indeed if you have a superposition of eigen states so what you're asking is what happens if i have a superposition of eigen states mm. then yes indeed you are not going to get back um an eigen state it's not an eigen state mm. right and uh, it will be some other state whose uh, coefficients have been modified by this lambda i right yeah so, so was that your question hmm. yes so that means these operators on any general state will do some kind of transformation indeed they will yeah yeah right so in that sense uh, i mean these operators and uh, the transformation uh, or i should say operator is a special case of transformation no there are two kinds of operators that's what we discussed right so what we've been discussing over the last few lectures yes unitary and hermitian right yeah so yeah. there are two classes of operators so actually i'm going to draw a kind of venn diagram uh, which i've been meaning to do today anyway so let me show that up front okay this is a cartoon picture of the space of all operators the set of all operators on a hilbert space or on a linear uh, vector space with an inner product right now we have discussed two classes one is hermitian okay hmm. and another which i am going to draw as an intersecting figure hmm. is unitary right okay hmm. so these are two different classes of operators hmm. right hermitian operators have the property that h is the same as h dagger hmm. unitary operators have the property that u u dagger is equal to u dagger u is identity hmm. okay and these two properties give rise to two physical uh, implications one that hermitian operators have real lambda i's and therefore they are the observables hmm. they correspond to physical observables unitary operators are the ones which lead to time evolution the way i mathematically argued this last time was to say hmm. that they are non preserving right, right. Right. and because they are norm preserving they contribute to time evolution so they are the quantum gates hmm. Hmm. right right now there is a commonality between both these classes okay hmm. and that's why i'm drawing this bigger box out here the commonality is both these uh, operators correspond to a class of operators called normal operators okay so a normal operator
is one that commutes with its adjoint. If you remember, we noted this kind of property earlier for the Hermitian operator, right? When we were trying to take exponential of the Hermitian operator and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. We noticed this. Now, this is true for the unitary operator also. What is the commutator? Commutator is the difference between the two ordered products, right? Now, matrix right. product, as you know, is not the same by ordering. So, n n dagger is, this, is not the same as n dagger n in general. But when n, n dagger is the same as n dagger n, then you call it a normal operator. And it's easy to see that both Hermitian and unitary operators are normal operators. Okay. And the thing about normal operators is that this is the class of operators which is diagonalizable. And uh, they are the ones which satisfy the so-called spectral theorem. Okay. So now in the course of this uh, uh, course, we will focus on this class of normal operators essentially, because mm. these two important categories belong there. Hermitian operators can also be quantum gates when they are unitary. So look at this intersection, right? Mm. So maybe I should just use a different color for that. So look at this intersection to go back to your question. Look at this intersection. So those operators which are in this intersection are both valid observables and valid gates, right? Mm -hmm. But not every valid gate is an observable. There are gates which we'll encounter which are not Hermitian, right? And similarly, not every observable is a valid quantum transformation. Not every Hermitian operator is unitary or norm-preserving. So mm. it's only those which are in the intersection. And we saw it, several examples of operators which are in the intersection of this, right? Which are those operators? Yeah, uh, others can also answer. Uh, yeah. Hadamard gate, ma'am. Indeed, the Hadamard is an example of something which is in the intersection. Other mm. operators? We looked at several examples. Basic. Indeed, yeah, the, all those XYZ operators, yeah, right? Yeah. Sigma X, right. Sigma Y, Sigma Z. On the one hand, mm. they correspond to spin observables. On the other hand, they are also the quantum gates, which lead to yes. uh, bit flip, which lead to phase flip, etc. right? So mm. this is the picture that we have, right? That you have this larger class of normal operators, which are operators that commute with their own uh, adjoint. And in that, you have these two special class of operators, Hermitian and unitary okay does that make yeah. it clear and and these two properties are different properties hermitian being hermitian and being unitary and they lead to two different physical uh, uh you know physical associations if you want right so the hermitian operators are the ones which give you the physical observables and the unitary operators are the ones which give you the quantum transformations or gates hmm. okay is that clear in english yeah yes ma'am yeah Sure. Any other questions so far? Okay, so this was a good question for me to start the lecture with because uh, I was indeed wanting to uh, show you this picture, right, of uh, these classes of operators that we'll be working with. So now what I want to talk about is this whole question of diagonalizability, right? And then that will naturally lead us to the measurement postulate. Okay, so that's what I want to discuss today. I just want to make one note here finally, and uh, that is that within the class of Hermitian operators, there is one very important class of operators that we'll be interested in, and that resides strictly inside the class of Hermitian operators. So I'm just going to call this as P, okay? And P is the class of positive operators. Okay? These positive operators oops. This means. so this class of positive operators are those whose eigenvalues. are positive, okay? If you wish to be more precise, you can say positive semi-definite, which means that the lambda i's 
are always greater than or equal to zero. So I can say positive semi-definite, which means that sometimes you allow for the zero eigenvalue as well, but that case will not bother us too much. So might as well call them positive eigenvalues. So as you can see, obviously the eigenvalues have to be first real in order for them to be positive, right? So they are indeed strictly sitting inside the class of Hermitian operators. And uh, there will be a question about positive operators in your first assignment where you will show some interesting properties, right? In fact, I will define positive operators slightly differently in the assignment. And from the definition, you can show this property, okay? So actually, I don't know um, how many participants we have right now. Let me just stop sharing. Um, Okay, we have about 43. So I just want to announce that assignment one will be posted on Moodle tonight, right? And it will be due, you'll have almost two weeks, right? It will be due only in early September. So please work on it. And basically it covers all the preliminary material that we've gone over in the last about nine lectures, right? I wanted to give roughly one assignment every nine, 10 lectures because we'll have about 40 lectures in the course, right? So there'll be about four assignments. That's the plan. Um, so anyway, just want to announce and please, uh, I'll also send you a mail once I post it, but yeah. So assignment one will actually tell you uh, a bit more about these, this class of positive operators, why it is important. You will start seeing in today's and subsequent lectures. Okay. So this is the kind of operator, uh, picture that we will be interested in. Right. And I think this is a useful picture to have in mind. Now, what about this class normal operators, right? What is special about normal operators? And that forms the statement. Um, yeah, Siddharth, was that a question? Whether that is still an eigenvalue equation? Yes, that is very much still an eigenvalue equation. No, no, I, I was like, I tried to answer that. Which one? Oh, the question by Ravi Kant. Okay, I did not see the question. What was the question? Bro, uh, how can an eigenvalue be equal to zero? Oh, I see. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, uh, that's also a valid eigenvalue equation. So yeah, zero can be an eigenvalue as well. In fact, the set the the set of eigen uh, the, the space rather the set of vectors on which an operator acts and gives with a zero eigenvalue is essentially what's called the null space of the operator. Right. Thank you, Siddharth. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So the spectral theorem. Basically, uh, so this this is at the heart of uh, uh, you know linear algebra or functional analysis or whatever. And I will not really have time to prove this theorem here, but I just want to state it, uh, you know, and uh, tell you the physical implications of this, right? And I have again made this a part of the assignment as well. It's an extra kind of question, but please, those of you who are interested, work through the proof. I think this box two point two. In Nielsen and Chuang does a fairly good job of stating the spectral theorem and proving it. Okay, so please look this up, right? So what the spectral theorem says is the following that so given any normal operator n then n can be expanded in terms of uh, so let me say it like this given a normal operator n there exist a set of orthogonal projectors I such that n can be expanded as sum over i lambda i pi, right? So this is a kind of if and only if statement that if you're given a set of orthogonal projectors and a set of so where lambda i are just some scalars, okay? The lambda i just belong to 
they're just some complex numbers right they're complex scalars okay um which are called so this set of lambda i they are indeed the eigenvalues of n right uh, they are also called the spectrum of n and hence the name spectral theorem and this kind of an expansion is what is called a spectral decomposition so another way of stating this as an if and only if statement would be to say that given any operator n there exists a set of orthogonal projectors such that n is sum over i lambda i p i if and only if n is a normal operator okay so it's an if and only if statement right so maybe i'll state it like that so let me state it in the if and only if way so we just say given any operator n right then there exists this set of uh, orthogonal projectors with this expansion if and only if n is normal okay and what's a normal operator that's what i just defined for you below that uh, an operator is said to be normal if it commutes with its adjoint right and this kind of an expansion is what is called a spectral decomposition so let's parse this a little bit okay uh, so what does one mean by orthogonal projectors okay so first of all what is a projector now we have seen examples of projectors earlier right so Okay, so what's a projection operator? Let's discuss this a little bit. Because this is at the heart of the measurement postulate after all. So, I say that an operator P is a projector. I uh, kind of use P for several kind of classes of operators, but now they'll be projectors, okay? So, P is a projection operator if and only if P is the same as P squared, okay? So if P is the same as P squared, we say that P is a projection operator. Now we have seen examples of this and these examples will kind of tell you uh, where this definition comes from, right? Or what is the implication of this definition? So uh, consider your uh, sigma Z operator, right? Uh, now we know that sigma Z is a normal operator. Yes, it's in fact both Hermitian and unitary. So this operator had this kind of a representation in the 0, 1 basis, and it had eigenvalues ket 0 and ket 1, right? Now we constructed two projectors out of this. Yes, this is what I will call P0, is a projection onto 0. You're asking me whether projection operators are diagonalizable? Yeah, indeed. Actually, I should say that a projection operator P, uh, actually I should start the definition like this, I should say that a Hermitian operator P is a projection uh, if and only if P is the same as P squared. So somewhere in that Venn diagram, I can also put in the class of projection operators, I'll put that in shortly as well, okay? Uh, in fact, you can tell me where that where this P should go in that diagram, okay? So, P is a projection onto ket 0. And remember, we noted this because now if I act, so what are the properties of this projection operator? If I act this on any arbitrary state psi, right? So, if I act this operator P0, right, on any state psi, right, what happens? So, let me say psi is, oops. So let me say that psi is alpha 0 plus beta 1, remember. So what happens when P0 acts on psi? Quick. 
Um, it, it projects it shy the... onto the kit zero. But what do you get precisely? What what is the that's the meaning of this? But I want to know what is the exact p factor you get. It's alpha zero. It's alpha, yeah. So what is alpha actually? Alpha is the inner product. So like I said, how will you work this out? So this is the same as saying I'm acting zero zero on psi, right? And zero psi is a number. This is just an inner product. It's a complex number. Get zero and zero psi inner product is what? Alpha, right? Because if I take inner product with in this equation, the inner product of zero with one is zero. So the beta term goes away. So I will simply have alpha zero, right? So this is a projection onto the ket zero. That's what we mean by this, right? It takes the component along ket zero and projects you down to that. Now, what is P naught squared? Right? Zero, zero times zero, zero. What is this? So how do you multiply two outer products like this? This is basically matrix multiplication of two matrices, right? In the matrix representation. But in the outer product representation, all of this simplifies, right? What happens? You can just take this here, part here, which is an inner product of zero with itself. So what do you get? One, one. One, so this answer is simply zero, zero, right? Because this has become one. So you're left with the ket zero and the bra zero, right? So indeed, you get back P zero. Now, physically, this makes sense, right? What is this saying? It's saying that if I apply the projection operator twice, it doesn't do anything beyond applying the projection operator once, but that is indeed the way it should be because the first projection has already projected you down to the state that you want to. Subsequent projections onto the same state are going to leave the state invariant, right? So P naught squared, if, you, if I apply the projection operator twice, the first application of the projection operator has already projected me down to ket zero. Now, applying a projection operator again on this, again going to give me alpha ket zero. No matter how many times I apply the projection, I'm going to get ket zero, right? So it makes sense that two applications of the projection operator should not do anything more than what a single application of the projection operator does, right? Okay, so we have one projection operator here. Uh, the second projection operator I can construct is this, which is P1. Again, you can note that P1 squared is the same as P1. Now, uh, here's a simple thing for you to think about. What are the eigenvalues of, you know, P0 or P1? Okay, first of all, are these operators Hermitian, the P0 and the P1? What kind of matrix representation does this have? This is 1, 0, 0, 0, right? In the 0, 1 basis. So, of course, P0 dagger is the same as P0. And actually, you can read off the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors from here. Uh, yeah. Can you? Ma'am, 1, 0 is eigenvector with eigenvalue 1, and 0, 1 is. Eigen, an eigenvector with eigenvalue zero. Indeed, yeah. But you one zero means what? Oh, you mean the column vector mother? Yes, good. Yeah, indeed, correct. So very good. So you see, this is actually a kind of diagonal representation already, right? So you can read off these eigenvalues if you will from here. So the eigenvalues of this projection operators are both. So note that p one is zero 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 one, right? And again, you see, so they both have eigenvalues. The lambda i's are simply 0 and 1. And the corresponding projection, which are the corresponding eigenvectors, will depend on whether you're talking about projection operator 0 or projection operator 1. Okay. Now, this is a simple 2 by 2 example of uh, outer product, which has become a projection operator. Now, are you all familiar with the idea of the rank of an operator? The 
the people know what rank of an operator means? Yes, no, quick. No, is it? Number of uh, independent rows of rows or column in a matrix at or number of non-zero eigenvalues. Ah, that's the definition that I prefer. Uh, so yes, good. So yeah, for those of you who don't know what the rank is, so this definition is a useful one to know. This is the number of non-zero eigenvalues that an operator has. So, now if I think of the sigma z operator, what is, what is its rank? Remember, we worked out its eigenvalues and eigenvectors earlier. So, how many non-zero eigenvalues does it have? Two. Two, exactly, right? Now, this operator acts on a two-dimensional complex linear vector space, right? C2. So, since its rank is indeed the same as the dimension of the space that it acts on, we say that this is what is called a full rank operator, right? So if you think of this space of C2 as some, again, I'm drawing several cartoon pictures today, but they serve to explain what we want. So if this is my C2 space, what it means is the sigma Z operator has a non-zero action or a non-trivial action on the entire space. There is no null space that this operator has within C2, right? So, sigma Z is a full rank operator, right? I hope you can also check that the other operators we have written down, sigma X, sigma Y, Hadamard, all of these guys, okay? They all have rank 2. Okay, please check. So, they are all full rank operators. Okay, but what about your projection operator? What about these projection operators? They have rank one. Just one. They have rank one, right? Because they have only one non-zero eigenvalues. What it means is, if I think of partitioning my C2 space, a very cartoon picture, huh? but the idea is if I partition my C2 space, there is a part which has a non-trivial action by P0, which is a projection onto 0, 0. There is a part which has a non-trivial action by P1, which is a projection onto 1, 1. Okay? So now, these are rank 1 projectors. Okay? So, what I want to do is to first understand the spectral theorem in terms of these kind of rank 1 projectors and that will pretty much suffice for us, okay? So, these, now, higher rank projectors exist, right? There are projectors which have rank 2 and of course, if I'm in higher dimensional spaces, there are projectors of higher rank as well, right? Can you think of a projection operator uh, with rank 2? in the C2 space? Um, like yes. When we talk of spin one operators, so mm -hmm. sigma Z that corresponds to this three dimensional system, they mm -hmm. yeah, have one zero and minus one. So rank is two. E, what do you mean? This sigma of a spin one operator, you said, not a spin half. Spin one, spin one. Spin half, this one, the same sigma z is what you're talking about. No, no. When we write z, z matrix for a spin one system, so okay. it it turns out to, it turns out to be a three cross three diagonal matrix with elements one zero minus one. Okay, but is every diagonal matrix a projection? Is that operator a projection operator? Does it satisfy whatever? That's a sigma z for a spin one operator, right? 
does it satisfy sigma uh, squared is the same as uh, sigma? Think about this. What 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 is the property that all of these operators satisfy? Sigma z squared. Okay, I guess you haven't worked this out yet, you guys. So yeah, what is sigma z squared? Oh, I got it. Yeah, I forgot that mean property p square c. Sigma z squared is identity indeed, as Siddharth said. In fact, so is sigma x squared, so is sigma y squared, so is the Hadamard squared. In fact, Hadamard squared is identity we saw. Last lecture, we explicitly saw this. So, none of these is a projection matrix. Oh, no, ma'am. I meant to say that uh, we could, like, a rank 2 could be identity matrix, right? Sorry? A rank 2 projection operator could be identity matrix. Indeed, indeed. Yes, thank you. That also is correct. Yes. Projection operator of rank 2. Yes, good. But yeah, let me just complete this question that Neil Khan was asking, uh, because this again is a common uh, confusion uh, that's possible to have, because uh, not every Hermitian operator is a projection operator, right? So the projection operator is a subclass of Hermitian operators. Not only is it a subclass of Hermitian operators, it is a subclass of this positive operator class that I defined, right? Because I'm going to now make the general statement that a projection operator always has eigenvalues 0 or 1. Okay, so let me make this class somewhat bigger. Actually, I should make the Hermitian class bigger. There are several interesting classes that we study inside this. Okay. Right. Uh, Hermitian, inside that you have uh, positive operators and inside that have, uh, so let me call the positive operators as some Q, okay? Uh, so I say that Q has positive eigenvalues and P is the class of projection operators, which is sitting inside, okay? All of this. So this- Ma'am, will, uh, will it intersect the green part in the positive operators? Which green part? Uh, can a positive operator be both a Hermitian and unitary? Can it be unitary? Um, well, uh, indeed, it is unitary actually because, okay, yeah, so maybe I should be careful when I draw this. Okay, yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, let's check that, right? So, in fact, Look at these projection operators, right? So the projection operators, I've already told you that it's Hermitian, right? Which means that P is the same as P dagger. And now I'm telling you that P squared is P, which means P, P dagger, right? Is the same as P dagger P, right? Which is P squared. Uh, but this P squared is not identity. Okay. So is this unitary? Okay, so no. that answered the no. question. Yeah, so projection operators are not unitary. Can I have a positive operator which is also unitary? I guess one could have. Uh, there's nothing that prevents positive operators from being unitary. So I guess one could have. So it's possible that the red could intersect the blue. Okay, but not the purple. Okay, so this is possible. Right. Sorry, that's become a messy figure now, but yeah, that's a good question. So this is possible that I could have positive operators which are unitary, but not projection operators because projection operators um, square to themselves, except see identity is now an example of everything. Okay, so in this, you please leave out identity operator. Okay, as um, Siddharth just pointed out, identity is also a projector. So that's what I was coming to next. But I hope this confusion is sorted that all Hermitian operators are not projection operators. Okay. They are all full rank operators. Yes. But what I was coming to is that the projection operators we wrote down are first of all rank one projectors. And these will play an important role now when I write down measurement. Uh, but what is more projection operators have to satisfy P squared is equal to P. Uh, only then it's a projection. Right. That's the projection property. That. Every time I add the operator again, it has to have a non, it has to have a trivial action. 
It is the first time the operator act, it projects down to whatever space it's projecting down, right? So projection operator of rank two in C2 or acting on C2 on a two dimensional space would be the identity operator, right? Because the identity operator, of course, satisfies I squared is equal to I. It has eigenvalues zero, it has eigenvalues one, right? No zero eigenvalues. So this is a non trivial operator. Well, rather, it's a trivial operator, but it's one which does not again have a null space, right? It's a so what is this a projection onto? In some sense, it's a projection onto the entire C2 space. So how do I think of identity as a projection? It's a projection onto this entire C2 space. But zero zero projects down only to one cut of the C2 space, and there is a completely non-overlapping cut that the uh, projection operator one projects down to. In fact, now you see identity can be written as P0 plus P1, right? Identity can be written as P0 plus P1. Uh, sigma Z on the other hand, how would you write it in terms of P0 and P1? The sigma Z operator. Zero minus P1. In, yes. So this, there you go. What you have now is the spectral decomposition of the sigma Z operator. So you have projected it, you have expanded it in terms of, so remember what should the spectral decomposition look like? For every normal operator, the theorem said that you have a set of orthogonal projectors, PI, weighted by the corresponding eigenvalues and that you can always represent the operator like this. That's what the spectral theorem says for a normal operator, right? So the lambda i's are the plus and minus one, the PIs are the P0 and the P1, and they are indeed orthogonal because ket0, ket1 is ket1, ket0 is zero. So if I act, if I do P0 times P1, what do I get? Zero, zero, one, one. So what is this? Zero. Indeed. So, Similarly, you can check that this is also zero. So this is what makes it a pair of orthogonal projectors. Okay. And in fact, if I have a set of projection operators, is said to be orthogonal, remember this was in the statement of the spectral decomposition, if they satisfy, or rather, we'll just make it different only, PI times PJ, right, is delta IJ times, I can either write PI or PJ, okay? Remember delta IJ is a chronicle delta symbol, this is zero if I is not equal to J, and this is one if I is equal to J. So if I is equal to J, this is like multiplying the same projection twice, right? And that, you know, P squared is P for every projection operator. Every PI in this set must satisfy PI squared is P. But when PI is not, when I is not equal to J, this should vanish. This product should vanish if they are orthogonal projectors. So now you revisit the statement of the spectrum theorem. It says that for every normal operator, you can write, find a set of orthogonal projectors uh, with this expansion, right? And uh, I can add to that, that this or set of orthogonal projectors will then also satisfy, so if the, so let me make this additional statement here. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll make that statement subsequently. But now look at this, right? So P0 minus P1 was sigma Z. So in some sense, P0 and P1 are the two orthogonal projectors that correspond to the two different eigenvalues of sigma Z. Notice that they satisfy also this property that P0 plus P1 is identity. So this kind of a relation is what is called a completeness relation. Right? And this is a property of any orthonormal basis. So 
So if I have an orthonormal basis EI, okay, let's do the following. We can construct projection operators. Of the form EI EI. Correct? So I can call this as PI. Okay. And now this is an orthonormal basis. So what is PI times PJ? You can check that this is indeed delta I P I J P I. What is more, if I sum over I E I E I, what is this matrix? So let me call this matrix M. What is this matrix? Right? Now, from the outer product representation, how do you get to the matrix notation? You have to take inner product on both sides with respect to some orthonormal basis, right? So let's take inner products with respect to this basis um, ij itself, right? So now if I take an inner product like this, if I take, if I act, so remember we said matrix elements, right? I'm going over this slowly because some of you may find some of these ideas new, so uh, please work this out with me. So what are the, so what is this matrix? That's what I want to work out, right? So what are the matrix elements? The matrix elements will be, I have to uh, sort of uh, left multiply with a bra, let's say EK, right? M, K, E, J. This will be the matrix element KJ of this matrix, right? Because remember we said every matrix can be written in this outer product form and every such outer product representation corresponds to a matrix. And this is the association. These are the matrix elements, right? I just have to expand this in some orthonormal basis. Now, what is MKJ? Please work this out quickly and tell me. Yes. Shouldn't be chronic. Sorry. Monica Delta Delta KJ. Indeed, this is Delta KJ. Because what happens? This EK acts on the left here. Right? Then this survives only when K is the same as I. But when EJ acts on the right here, then this survives only when I is the same as J. So then this whole term survives only when K is the same as J. Right? So what kind of matrix is this? So what is this matrix? This is one only when K is equal to J, which means all the diagonal entries. And all the off diagonal entries are zero. So indeed, this is nothing but the identity matrix. Right? So this is what is called a completeness relation. What this is telling you is what we saw with the simple example of the Sigma Z and its two eigen uh, projectors. Now I'll start calling these as eigen projectors, right? Between these two eigen projectors, they covered the space, right? They spanned the space. So similarly, in a, now this is a two dimensional space, okay? So you cannot have more than two, remember we said you cannot have more than two orthogonal uh, vectors. So your basis cannot have more than two elements for a two dimensional space. So this is it. This is the partitioning of the space, right? But now if I have a higher dimensional space, then I can have this partitioning of the space in terms of the different orthogonal projectors, right? Uh, and the sum of all these projectors must indeed be the entire space, a projection onto the entire space, which is the identity matrix, right? So that simple cartoon picture then helps you understand what this completeness relation is saying, that the sum of this set of orthogonal projectors essentially spans the space, right? And what the spectral theorem is telling you is how to get to such a uh, set of orthogonal projectors. Take any normal matrix, means take any Hermitian or unitary matrix, and you can always arrive at a set of such orthogonal projectors. So that's the statement of the spectral theorem. Now, 
I have only dealt with rank one projectors. Yeah, it is possible to have higher rank projectors, but that's slightly beyond outside our. This thing, I encourage you to go uh, read up the box 2.2 in its and so on. I think I've given you sufficient um, information to go read through the proof of the spectral theorem, right? And also to understand what, you know, what happens when you have higher rank projectors, yeah? which are not identity, by the way. They can be non-trivial higher rank projectors. Okay, fine. So, uh, one last observation I want to make is the difference between Please note this between a spectral decomposition for a Hermitian operator versus a unitary operator. When I write a spectral decomposition for a Hermitian operator like this, now I can say PI or I will say I will write it like this, right? Lambda I, EI, EI. What is the property of these lambda I's? They all are real. But now if I write the same thing for a unitary matrix, right? sum over i, uh, let me say gamma i, um, f i, f i, right? Some set of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Now, these eigenvalues are not real. They are in general complex, right? They are in general complex. In fact, what you can show is that this gamma i's, because Recall, u, u dagger is u dagger, u is equal to identity, correct? So, this implies something specific for the gamma i's, okay? So, it implies, so can you tell me what this implies for the gamma i's? Those of you who may know something about this. That is absolute value squared is equal to 1, absolute value is equal to 1. Yes, indeed. So the absolute value of the gamma i is always equal to 1. Okay. So I want you to try and show this based on the spectral decomposition. Okay. It's very easy to show this once you have the unitarity property and the spectral decomposition. Okay. So please try your hand at this proof. You will find that the assignment has. Uh, several such proofs, okay? If you're not able to do this, we can discuss this in next class, but it's very easy to show this. So, essentially, unitary operators have eigenvalues which are, whose argument is one, right? So, they are pure face. They're complex numbers that are pure face. So, they can be written essentially as e to the i phi sub i, where this little i is the index denoting the ith eigenvalue. So, essentially, the gamma i's are this form. So, please note this contrast, right, that permission operators have, of course, the real numbers are some subclass of this, right, and you can see that the Pauli operators easily satisfy this because their gamma i's are essentially plus and minus one, right, they're real, they're plus and minus one, so their modulus is one, okay, so there's some special matrices which have both these properties, but yeah, so just keep this in mind, do not get carried away because they're all diagonalizable and normal, etc. So don't get carried away into uh, mixing up these two things. Okay, so now I'm at 9.52. Uh, uh, should I state the measurement postulate or not? Questions? Uh, Ma'am, as yeah. we saw in the previous part of the lecture that the identity matrix can be treated as a rank to uh, projected of Yes. That also be uh, true for any other linear combination of the projector operators like the sigma z. The problem is that sigma z squared is not sigma z, no? Like I said, a projection operator has to satisfy sigma z squared is the same as, uh, I mean, the p squared is same as p. That's the definition of a projection operator. If it does not satisfy this, right? Uh, yeah, yes, okay, yeah. I mean, I'm, okay, yeah, I got the answer. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Other questions? 
yeah so i think it's not fair for me to start stating the measurement postulate now so let me do that on uh, thursday's class okay uh, so one last thing let me just state this that you can always construct uh, in any dimensional uh, Hilbert space, you can construct a projection operator for any state, right? A rank one projection operator for any state. Uh, how would you do that? So I will often call this as P sub psi, okay? It's a projection onto psi. It's simply this outer product, right? We saw this already that this is a projection onto psi, right? When I, in one of the previous lectures, I had stated this. I'm just formally noting that this is always a projection operator because this will satisfy this property that P psi squared, which is psi psi, right? Is, okay. And of course, it's acting on any state. We project you down to psi with, the inner product being the uh, scalar in front. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, ma yeah. So sure. uh, we are having, like, for example, we are having uh, these eigen projectors of this space. Mm -hmm. uh, we are saying that when we apply a projector to the Suppose basis vector. So mm -hmm. one otherwise for, for a particular basis vector we get one, otherwise we get zero. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that means uh, for any particular general state, again I'm going to the general state, the linear combination of basis vector. Mm -hmm. so if we apply a projector to a general state, we will get the uh, projection for a particular basis state. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, is it the reason why we are using uh, only two level systems for representing these qubits? No, no. I mean, I can write down a higher dimensional operator, right? Like uh, uh, someone pointed out. Uh, I mean, I can write down. So, this this statement that I wrote down is beyond two dimensions. No, this uh, when I write down something like this, this is I going from one to D. This could be a d-dimensional state. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. for example, I can have a spin one uh, system, right? As uh, one of our, as Nilikant I think was pointing out, I can write down a sigma z equivalent operator for this, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm just writing down something, uh, but don't think of this as sigma z. Consider this as some other operator h, right? So, for example. So I can call this as ket one, or rather ket zero, ket one, and ket two. It's a three dimension, uh, uh, an, an alphabet with three symbols. Hmm. It's a ternary alphabet in the classical sense, and I'm associating a space with that. So this is a Q trit, right? Right. Now this is a Hermitian operator. This itself is not a projector, but hmm. I can make these orthogonal projectors out of this, hmm. right? and I can write down projection. Uh, you know, I can write down P0, P1, P2. You can see that they're all projections and I can write down uh, P0 plus P1 plus P2 will be identity, the three cross three identity matrix. This matrix itself will be of the form P0 plus P1 minus P2, etc. Mm -hmm. Right. So all of these, so there's nothing that prevents us from expanding the whole thing to higher dimensions. I'm just giving you an example of the qubit and the two dimension because it's easy, first of all, to understand the idea. And also because we are mainly focusing on qubits in this course, right? That's that is sufficient material for us to discuss algorithms and gates and everything, right? So, yeah. Yeah. but you can write down q trits. You can write down what are called q dits, which is any d-dimensional space. You can have the same thing. You can write down this basic computational basis. You can write down projectors. You can all these properties go through. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. This last part that for the psi state that we have defined the projection operator, it's just a projection on itself. Indeed, yeah, yeah. This one, right? Yes, this uh, p psi, psi psi is indeed a projection onto psi itself, yeah. 
So that's what I mean by position operator for the states. Or maybe I should say on the state side. Yeah. Okay. Um, ma'am. Yeah. Um, regarding the rank, uh, so we define the rank as like a, a non-zero eigen values uh, for um, sigma uh, x y z. So I believe uh, the eigen value is uh, plus h bar by two and minus h bar by two. So that's the way we define its rank is two, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, indeed, the number of non-zero eigenvalues, that's the rank, right? So it's plus minus h bar by 2, exactly. Okay. So there are two, two non-zero eigenvalues, so it has rank 2. Okay, yeah, for yeah. add mod, um, how come it's 2? Um, we forget. You the... have to tell me, you have to tell me. What are its eigenvalues? You have to work out and tell me. Okay. So that's for next class, okay? Mm -hmm. Work out the eigenvalues of the add mod matrix and tell me. Okay? <laughs> okay. Hmm. Okay, so uh, I think it's already 10, so let's meet uh, on Thursday.